funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council. I want to thank our ASL interpreters uh, for helping us to make this panel more accessible. And uh, thank you also to School of Art and Desatel Faculty of Music uh, colleagues and staff, especially Justin Bear, Frank Fernandez, Kaylin Harrison, and Adam Lidzinski, Canada Council for the Arts, uh, <laughs> um, for assistance in facilitating this hybrid live and virtual talk. If anyone is watching over on Zoom or YouTube and having technical difficulties, please uh, direct message one of our staff and we'll do our best to help you out. And if you are watching over on Zoom or YouTube and have a question, you can post those in the comments and they'll be relayed over here to Abigail. And of course, I would like to extend my extreme gratitude uh, to Abby for organizing such a thoughtful, provocative, and extremely well-researched exhibition and ancillary programming. Um, it's a real honor to be able to present this work and to be able to work with you. Um, just a brief bio. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Abigail Ald is a writer and curator whose work considers human altered environments. Her research explores how systems of power and relation are reflected in the way buildings and cities are constructed, with a particular interest in the relationship between urban environments and the ecosystems that sustain and support them. Abigail holds an MA in cultural studies, um, specializing in curatorial practice from the University of, of Winnipeg and a Bachelor's of Environmental Design from OCAD University. Uh, she lives here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 territory, and is a descendant of British Canadian settlers. Abigail is also a founding member of Parameter Press, a collective publishing risograph printed artist editions, and is currently writing a nonfiction manuscript about Tindallstone. Um, in conjunction with this exhibition, we're also going to be hosting, along with the Faculty of Architecture, a forthcoming talk by landscape architect uh, Jane Ma Hutton, as well as a virtual panel that will feature a couple of the artists from the show, Vanessa Higgin and Trisha Wozni. So please visit umanitoba.ca slash art slash moving dash matter, or follow us on social media uh, to learn more about those programs and um, other offerings that the gallery has. And finally, I would like to um, extend my warm uh, gratitude uh, uh, to you all for coming and for bearing with us and um, sharing physical and virtual space with us today. So please join me in welcoming Abigail Ald. Thank you. Um, is, is it a screenshot? Okay, cool. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Do a screenshot. I can do a screen share, but do like it's not for some reason the and I will do that, but the camera is not. Um, yeah, oh, just oh shoot! Do you want and it's also disabled the. Oh, who's the host? Uh, Justin. Okay. Okay. I'll get him. I'll text yeah, him. and I don't know if I because the camera never came back came on. Okay. So should I log out on here and come back in maybe? Yeah. Pardon me. Thanks for holding, bearing yeah. with everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's I could. Yeah. So I don't know if it's because it's. Do you think it's trying to get a camera from something else? Because it seems like it hasn't even. Could be. All right. Okay, so we're just, this is Abby here. We're, <laughs> I know you can't uh, see me folks on Zoom, um, but we're going to sort that out and I think at least be able to share my screen, um, which is where all the good stuff is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because
Okay. Oh, that's for the computer. Okay. Yeah, that's for obviously. Okay. I think we should have enabled screen share on. Okay. So let's give it a chat. There we go. Perfect. We'll do that. Let's go. All right. Okay. So we can't see me, but uh, yeah, we'll get this view. Can the interpreter be seen? Just a question. Okay. Oh, I feel like I see myself on the screen, so I wonder if that may be. Yeah. Okay. Sweet. Hello. Can, can the interpreter be seen awesome. as well? Okay. I'm just gonna situate myself Great. here. Thank Sorry. You. Uh, Thank you. Great. Yes, okay, so thank you all for um, bearing with um, this and for coming. It's great to see some folk in person. This is my first in-person presentation in a while um, and also be able to uh, present to folks on Zoom as well. Um, so first, thank you, Blair, uh, for the introduction and for contextualizing the exhibition as it relates to the institution's efforts to recognize the territory brand. Um, I'd also like to thank Blair for being really being the catalyst that uh, has made this public presentation possible. Um, and I'm going to go through a couple more um, thank yous. But while I do that, give you this funny picture of me <laughs> to look at <laughs> at the quarry. Um, so as an independent curator, everything I do is hypothetical until it's given life through collaboration. First and foremost with artists who, uh, whose generosity astonishes me, um, and then through the considerable effort of efforts of gallery, school, and contract workers who helped realize this exhibition. Um, so big thank you to those folks um, who made the project possible, and, and specifically everyone, as Blair's mentioned, who's making today's presentation possible. As Blair said, in addition to the gallery support, this project has received uh, a project funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and the Manitoba Arts Council. And I'd also like to extend a special thank you to Gillis Quarries who provided stone for some of the work in the exhibition, gave quarry tours to artists and whose generosity in supporting it and opening their archives to my research has really enabled this work. Um, the genesis for my interest in Tyndall Stone was developed uh, with significant support from the Winnipeg Architecture Foundation uh, and my curatorial research uh, began with the Winnipeg Arts Council uh, funding and mentorship with Jenny Western in Malwa's foundation mentorship program. Um, so I'm going to begin, set the tone a little bit for my presentation today, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the artists work in the show and sort of my research that informs the co curatorial concept. But I'm going to begin first with uh, something that came out of the panel last week with Casey Adams and Mariana Munoz Gomez, who are two artists in the exhibition, and uh, uh, geologist Graham Young. Um, so in the panel, uh, Gra oops, whoop, uh, Graham started off by saying this, this phrase or state, making a statement that Tyndall Stone um, got to stand is made uh, from life. Or I think I initially thought it heard it as Tyndall Stone um, is, is full of life, which is true, but it's also just straight um, uh, made, but it's compositionally made of life. So the the car calcium carbonate it comes from de decomposing skeletons, and then it's very very visibly. Um, represents life through it, through ancient life, through the visible fossils. Um, KC picked up on this and related it to uh, grandfather rock teachings. And Mary Mariana carried it on to talk about how human histories are layered, layered uh, human histories uh, relate to rock um, and are expressed through use, the use of stone. Um, so this is what I mean, this is, a classic uh, look at Tyndall stone with this modeled uh, pattern and the and the body fossil. So often you think of it as being uh, as the fossils, the body fossils you see as representing life. Um, but 
something that I find really compelling about it is that these the model pattern is also a representation of life. Those are trace fossils called thalassinoides, um, which is the fossilized movement of organisms burrowing through sediment as it's hardening. Um, so like a like a dinosaur print, but this is more like ancient the ancient precursors to shrimp. Um, so uh, that's something that really this pattern was really a, a appeal to Kara Hamilton, who's a Toronto artist who first made this work um, in 2017 for Plug and ICA Stages Biennial. And Kara was really, uh, who's also a jewelry artist and is really interested in inherent decoration or decorative, um, uh, the decoration that is inherent to uh, material and felt really connected to that with Tyndall Stone and described it, its kind of borderline gaudiness of the pattern, which I think is a fair assessment. Um, but the, another thing that I think is really interesting, the flip side of that is that this pattern um, is more than a pattern is really intrinsic to the material. Um, so as said, the burrows are these tunnels that go through in three dimensions through the material um, and actually uh, contribute to its strength. So it would not be a a uh, stone that could be quarried in large blocks if it weren't for this matrix of movement from a long time ago that allows the material to stay. That's one um, So the, my curatorial essay begins with this question, um, what happens when rock becomes stone? Um, which is a bit of a tricky thing because they're kind of the same thing, rock and stone are the same, but I think of it as sort of the crux of my, what I'm trying to present or have people consider with this work. Um, and that is both trace, it's really a tracing of how a Manitou bedrock ridge became a recognizable model building material that faces, faces the surfaces of cities across Canada. So Tinnelstone is both a trademark building product and part of the Selkirk member of the Red River Formation the rock body that the stone is excavated from. This is a photograph from Lisa Stinner-Kun, one of the artists in the show and here with us. Um, not, this is a photograph that's not in the show, but from her larger series, New, new Material. Um, and that is of the looking it's, uh, at the, the quarry. So looking at the stone in situ as bedrock versus um, those are lintels on their way out from the processing plant. So what I'm trying to get at with this question is that while stone and rock is essentially the same thing, um, we think about bedrock and de detached material differently, and that's reflected in the language we use to describe them. Um, in Moving Matters, artists contemplate the difference, this difference, considering both the implications of this transformation and the resonance imbued through human rock relations. These artworks offer ways to reorient toward the bedrock that grounds life and is the foundation for an understanding of Tyndall Stone, the material. So to know Tyndall Stone then, you need to know where it comes from. Not, and that's not just the name of the town, which is Garson, Manitoba, or the name of the fourth, gener fourth generation company, Gillis Quarries, that own all the quarrying rights and rights to market the stone. So of course, this here is, not Garson, but Tyndall, the neighboring town that has the train station, and uh, hence the name, that's how, where it was shipped from. Um, so today, so I'm gonna, or gonna go through these, what I'm calling orientation points, different, and talk about some of the artwork in the show in relation to these uh, places that I think are significant in an understanding of the material. So first talking about the, the formation, then the rapids, um, then the quarries, and then um, what I'm calling, this, this is not a, a, a wide, widely used term, but a mater the material shed. Um, so think, uh, thinking about where the material has been dispersed. So, and I am trying to think, like, think of that as you think about watershed or I'm a knitter and the term fiber shed has become a, a commonly used um, uh, idea to think about how um, uh, material for clothing and can be related to a specific landscape and how that can be a cyclical 
a thing. So I'll talk a little bit more when, once I get to that. Um, so the formation. Um, Tyndall stone comes from the late Ordovician of the Paleozoic era. So about 450 million years ago, it is the sediment that was um, settling um, within a shallow sea near the equator. So this is what the life would have been like then. Um, it's a time when there was no, uh, no life on land, but really complex, diverse life underwater. Since then, due to plate tectonics, tectonics and continents uh, breaking apart and reforming, this, as it was hardening, this mass of sediment moved up to the northern hemisphere to where we are, we now call Manitoba. So it's, it exists in Manitoba, but elsewhere. Um, this is a map of Manitoba and this the surface geology or uh, the bedrock. Um, the uncolored area is older Precambrian rock and everything that's colored is sedimentary stone. Um, so, and with the green section being Ordovician, which is what um, Tyndall stone comes from. It's one of the few Ordovician rocks. Um, and uh, we're then going to do a section to see how this is slicing through the province. So look at this um, red line here, because that's where we're going to go. This next image is that a slice through with Saskatchewan over here, the border, and this is Ontario there. And then this is the, uh, the all the sedimentary rock, the Ordovician here. And then this thin layer over top. Um, is uh, the drift or what, what the bedrock is overlaying with. So everything that we, all of our lives exist in this drift of unconsolidated um, material that's in, in the midst of becoming eventually a long time from now, geologic stone. Um, so near the outcrop belt, so that's where the Ordovician rock is, is the last layer of bedrock. The drift is very thin. You can see, oop, this, Um, that's Lake Winnipeg, just to give you a sense uh, there. So Tyndall Stone comes from the Selkirk member of the Red River Formation. Um, this, the colored area, again, are all the Ordovician rock. You can see the lakes there to orient yourself. And then the Red River Formation is the orange section. And the Selkirk member is a got to be careful with my mouse here, <laughs> um, is, uh, is not, it's, the members are not distinct. It's yet another smaller distinct um, uh, body, um, but it's most, it's distinct in the southern section of, right, so kind of just around here. I'm almost done with these maps. <laughs> um, so look, if you look, this is what we were looking at here, the outcrop belt of the um, Red River Formation, and it is the dark, the highlighted here showing it through Manitoba. You can see the geographic map below of, of uh, Saskatchewan, Montana, North Dakota. Um, it is the outer edge of a, de a depression called the Willitson Depression in that's centered on Willitson, North Dakota. So that we relate to it where it outcrops along there in some places, some places not because the drift is, is over top and we're not really aware of bedrock, um, but it exists way deeper below ground and in, in, it follows this depression in the center of the continent. And the last thing we're gonna look at here is a GIF showing these layers of rock building up on top of each other. So the Red River Formation is old, so it comes soon, look for a lilac. Uh, there it is, there, so see that outcrop belt, and then it curves into Saskatchewan, where it's known as the, uh, the Yuamad Formation, which is fairly similar, but not exactly the same. Um, yeah. Okay, so the first, the artwork I want to talk about in relation to this, the first, this is Jason DeHand's uh two sculptures, Free and Easy Wanderer Red River. Now, 
the Red River here is not the Red River formation that's being really um, noted in the exhibition, but actually the geo, uh, the geographic location where he, uh, where the fossils that he typically uses in this work were found. So this is an ongoing series of assemblies of um, uh, humidifiers and fossils um, with the water diffusing around the fossils and slowly breaking or much faster than would happen naturally, breaking the um, fossils into and uh, misting the fossilized remains into the air. Um, the fossil, this one is a, a brachiopod, um, which is from a Devonian rock. Um, and what are typically the fossils that uh, Dehan shows with this work. And then this P is a solitary rugose uh, horn coral from the Red River Formation rock. It's from the quarry. So that flat um, slice is because it was, it came from a larger quarry block of, uh, of rock. Um, so in the curatorial essay, I suggest that J Jason or Dehan's sculptures could be er interpreted as metaphors for human intervention that disperse and slowly wear away at the expanse of rock bodies over time. Um, but in talking about this work now in relation to this, these, what I think of as ancient lake deposits that exist underground, I didn't want to think about it differently. Um, and think about the, the act of collecting this stone as it is these stones, both the Red River Formation um, um, and the Devonian rock. Um, and amidst the surface matter is a way of connecting to these bodies of material that exist underground. Um, and a way, it's a way of seeing how that can, the relationship to the surface of what exists underneath us. Um, the other work I would like to talk about is Mariana Munoz Gomez a uh, Valar Ante Rocas in thinking about a rock for me, the Tyndall Stone, which is at the north of Turtle Island or um, uh, North America, um, and uh, a volcanic stone from Morelos, uh, Mexico. So Mariana's work ref uh, reflects on how history histories are layered in places. So her work, their work contends with the layering of uh, cities over top of each other through stone construction, both in Mexico City and here in terms of the way Canada grew as a country post-Confederation. Um, and also looking at how stones are carried both by human bodies that move and are displaced and by human led dispersal of stone um, uh, and through rock bodies too that are always um, in a state of motion. Um, I think this work is important to me, very important to me in terms of being the one, um, well, I guess now that I think of it, Jason's also has another stone in, but being uh, something that connects Tethers, Tyndall Stone's history to other um, histories with material and with place. Um, and I think that it's it's easy to get, or I am certainly zeroing in on the Tyndall Stone story, but to make the connection that that is a part of um, a much wider world. And, and, and that is very significant as well, that these are, uh, um, these are, we are always in proximity. Um, yeah. So the next place, I'm gonna just take a drink of water. Uh, is the rapids. Um, so this photograph is not of a quarry or of the rapids actually, um, but it's the preparation work for the St. Andrews Lock and Dam uh, in Lockport that was completed in 1910 um, and raised the water level um, to submerge the rapids and make the, in order to make the river navigable by large shipping vessels. So this is the preparation work for that, where they're getting down to the bedrock, which is Red River Formation limestone um, in that area. So the rapids, also known as So Alabish, or eventually St. Andrew's Rapids, has been an anchor point for human rock relations for millennia. 
Long before the Selkirk member of the Red River Formation was named, the rock outcropped naturally along the river banks and across the river, breaking its flow into rushing rapids. Um, so this is really where um, I am understanding that, or I have sort of pinpointed, and my understanding is that uh, people began, began and people's lives were um, lived in relation to this rock as it existed within the geographic environment. Um, and this really has for going back about five to 6,000 years, been a significant cultural landscape, a place for meeting, trade, renewing relationships, establishing marriages, and conducting ceremonies. Um, so the work in the exhibition that relates to this, one of them is uh, Christina Benera's Lockport Wave. So this is in the lobby gallery. Don't Definitely don't miss it. I think it's a uh, very important intro to the subject in my eyes. Um, this video and text piece, so it's a, a video and then you can see the text beside, um, explores the layering loss of histories in the artist's hometown of Lockport. One of those being the loss of the archeological site that publicly shared information about this uh, thousand year history in the place. Um, so the, the video component is uh, uh, stitched together YouTube clips of like found YouTube footage of pelicans um, that are bobbing in the water, catching fish from the, um, from, from the dam, cascading from the dam. And just a, image that I want to leave with you thinking about that is definitely not obvious. You wouldn't know approaching this work, but I think about when I, it's a funny, I think it's a funny video watching their, the strange prehistoric birds, but is that, that um, rock formation, the, the broken up stone is still there deep below there underneath these guys on the surface there is that we it's it's lost to us you are, it's not something that you can see but it is still there um the next work that contends with this area is casey adams jagged worldviews so this work builds on uh, adam's engagement with sherds or fragments of pottery from her indigenous ancestors including some found in the lockport archaeological site uh, the riverbank in this area holds shards of black duck and Selkirk vessels, some of which inform Adam's incorporation of these clay technologies in her practice. So the bottom piece is, uh, and here is a, is a vessel that uh, Casey made um, using techniques that she has learned and taught, taught herself that are stemming from these uh, pottery traditions. Um, the title for this piece references Dr. Leroy Littlebear's 2009 text, Jagged Worldviews Colliding, which outlines differences between Indigenous and European worldviews, describing how fundamentally opposing ways of interpreting the world are apparent in distinct cultural values and social structures. Next, we're going to go to the quarries. Um, so this is... If I think about a 1930 image. I really like it because I gotta use this cursor here, but you can see this drift that I keep talking about is so thin. It's just this, an unbeknownst, you'd never know <laughs> that it's, there's this very rectilinear when it's being excavated landscape just below. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is a also a 30s, which is kind of a one of there were the most the most operating at the same time quarries around that time. Um, so this is a listing of them, a diagram showing um, what is active right now is kind of around six and seven. Um, and then if you can see if you see here this line is that that's the spur line to the Tyndall station that we saw a photograph before um, and was the only way the material went for when it was uh, shipped for a long time and then eventually the with the highway um, and then we're next going to look at work by Patrick Dunford that, that contemplates the these quarries numbers the three and four on this map um 
So these are drawings uh, based on sketches that Patrick Denford did well bit when and several visits to the quarries in the in August 2021. Um, and they are of inactive quarries. Um, I think, yeah, of those two inactive quarries. Um, and he, uh, he is really interested in how these environments are being reclaimed by plant, by both plant and animal life and by people. So you can see the swimming and evidence of bush parties. Um, uh, yeah, and in thinking about how um, this, this, this reclamation uh, and also the enduring uh, effects uh, of um, the industrial excavations. Uh, next is uh, Lisa Stiner Kuhn's work. Um, so this, uh, as I, I, I just I had shown another one just in the very beginning, but uh, working Lisa was one of the first artists that uh, was the first artist that I worked with um, on this subject matter it, that, way back in 2016, I think. Um, uh, Lisa photographed the quarry, went out and has been back um, since. And I think I don't, it's too far gone now for me to be able to um, fully articulate what, uh, what, what was my desire, but, um, or what um, was the impetus, I guess, for that. Um, but that was in the early days of me doing this research. And I had been to the quarries and had seen photographs of the quarries and just, and was aware of some, uh, was familiar with Lisa's work and just felt like I needed Lisa to see the quarries and show us through her uh, eyes them. And um, yeah, so this is what has resulted from that work. And I think that, and that project was 100% the, uh, what eventually led to working with several artists um, to think about the subject matter. Um, so what do we have here? So the, the Lisa's, the Sunakun's photographs are both of the exterior quarry pits that you imagine and also the processing plants. So they are immersive large scale photographs present stilled vistas of landscapes undergoing constant incremental change. Um, and the interior photographs, well, whereas the interior photographs, um, are, uh, in, <laughs> I'm gonna, sorry, uh, Lisa, in the interior photographs, transformation is studied through the ephemera of stone processing, collected dust, sludge, and equipment indicates processing while the absence of human beings heightens curiosity about those involved in the labor of production. I'm just... Well, Catherine uh, Boyer's work, uh, Notes on Harvesting, also looks at the quarry processing or the quarry environment. Um, this the, there is, you may not realize it, but there is Tyndall stone in this work. So the Catherine's work, uh, Catherine collected stone from the rubble pile and, and also harvested uh, plant material from the exav excavation site, which she then made a uh, paper out of and wrapped that paper over the stone. And then it's uh, as, and then assembled those pieces and again, wrapped the material. So in reassembling the constituent parts of a landscape that produces building stone, Boyer gestures toward another way of caring for and harvesting material. The blue palette suggests the stone pile, a carn maybe is heading somewhere, while the delicate overlay of paper and hand stack stone reveal a human presence that grounds the marker, contradicting the effervescing effect of trans global shipping trajectories. While notes on harvesting may not be a marker per se, it does provide a point from which to reorient oneself toward, toward the quarry landscape and the histories of human relation to this rock turned stone. And the last word that was very, the, 
that looks at the quarry environment is Trisha Wozni's Millions and Millions, um, which also harvests material from the quarry site, this time industrial derotritus. So this, so wood, rusted steel straps, bottle caps, and twine. This isn't the best photograph of the jewelry, so you got to go and take a look at it. Um, are shaped into brooches, necklaces, rings, earrings, and a tie pin, each made to mark a detail of the aerial view over the quarries. This narrative jewelry sculpture can commemorates Wozni's father's, father's work as a homesteader nearby and as a laborer in the Garson quarries. Industrial discards are turned into precious tokens, imbuing the material with value while honoring difficult landscape histories. Okay, so the last is this funky word of mine, the material shed. Um, so like I said, we're thinking of, I'm thinking about this, like you think of a watershed, this is the watershed of Lake Winnipeg or like a fiber shed, um, which is a designated area with, within which efforts are made to harness and use natural resources, in this case, fi case fibers, dyes, and labor in a responsible way that minimizes waste and creates opportunities, not just for sustaining these resources, but for improving them over time in positive feedback cycles. So this is a network of, of places that are organizing as fiber sheds. Um, and the Pemina fiber shed is the local one. So um, these of uh, watershed, fiber shed, and uh, what a stone shed are not equivalent. I'm not, um, my way of thinking using this framework isn't the same as those. I think of watershed is primarily something that's naturally occurring and maybe altered or contaminated by human settlement and act or activity, whereas a fiber shed is wholly related to human-led agricultural industry, approaching it in a way to kind of shift the sustainability and uh, of that those practices and the, the um, plate rooted in place. Um, but my way of looking at Tindallstone in this framework is a really just about connecting the dispersal of the material to its place of origin. Um, oh, snap. <laughs> Shoot, it looks terrible. Sorry. Um, well, you can't read much from this, but um, these squares are, wow, I'm sorry about that, are, uh, this is a map, as it says, of limestone that used for building purposes. Really, these are the main sites, the only sites for, for uh, uh, limestone used in construction in Canada. Tindallstone has a captured market over here, and you can sort of make it cut out the, these lines coming from here, which is the railway system. That's mainly why I wanted to show this map to show how that is, how material flowed away from here. Obviously now uh, it's done mainly by a uh, uh, truck. Um, so for every block of Tindallstone shipped afar, there is a local match in reverse a mirror of what has been built reflected in the deepening voids within this area's bedrock. In ghostly silhouette, the hollows of these open pit quarries reflect the volume of construction elsewhere. Um, so Evan Collis's two large scale drawings, Winnipeg Union Station and Perry Epic, very much contend with how Tindallstone was moved across the prairies first by rail, um, both logistically, but also it in being used uh, quite a bit by uh, railway uh, companies in their, um, in the type and the architectural language and um, style, the, the branding of the institutions. So in, in railway train stations, as well as hotel, um, hotels. And that is, an example of the many ways that Tindallstone became mainly because it was 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 available, but it became associated with the kind of architecture that uh, um, Canada was um, uh, using to develop its uh, identity as a new nation. 
Um, so I'm going to run through a little bit of architecture here. We're still um, just that, a very cursory look at how it's being used, Tyndall Stone. Um, so what what has been built? Um, places uh, that are built to exert power and endurance. So it's as a long a building a material with a long life cycle. It's used in buildings that are meant to last. Um, so uh, legislative buildings, courthouses, jails, banks. This is a fun. The Bank of Commerce in Regina was a, was initially a Bank of Commerce in Winnipeg in Winnipeg's early days, and then uh, it quickly was outgrown, and so the building was packed up and shipped to Regina and then rebuilt. <laughs> like, which to me is just like such a good example of, but just like it's yeah. Well, I say se seconds cast off, but this idea that it was just like. Uh, call it like our Canada was just spreading west and it was just and Winnipeg had it for a bit it got too big move it and keep moving um, yeah a buildings uh, housing public utilities this is a uh, water treatment plant in Alberta um, but I'm a fun one to look for here are uh, MTS utility buildings or the uh which are all over the city. They're not used so much anymore, but there's lots of interesting MTS insignia in Tindallstone. Um, and that, those are examples of how it really became part, yeah, part of a, a corporate identity. Department stores are another big example of that. This is the, the Bay downtown when it had a, an arcade um, and a Bay, a mid-century Bay in Saskatoon um, that was con that, uh, converted into lofts or residential uh, in, the, in the 90s, I think, or maybe the early 2000s. Um, and there are like almost, there are many, many Eaton's and Hudson's Bay buildings across Western and Eastern Canada built in Tyndall Stone. Um, places of cultural reverence, theaters, auditoriums, stadiums, places of worship, museums, I'm giving older examples, but there, this continues really to this day. Um, institutions that serve everyday life, uh, post offices, libraries, schools, train station. So this is the Union Station in Regina. If you remember the in Evans drawing, uh, that was the Winnipeg one. They're very similar, different scale, but very similar. Um, so there are upwards of 6,000 Tyndallstone projects worldwide with the highest concentration in Western Canada, hundreds in Eastern Canada, the US and abroad. Well, the examples I've shown represent a cross section of building types for every landscape, for any, every landscape building, something that usually involves an architect and custom shop drawings. There are dozens more builder spec projects constructed from ready-made off the lot stone blocks. So thousands of strip malls, apartment buildings, and houses built through the 20th century to today. Um, I think I'm going to, I'm just going to skip through this slide till we can get to the end here. Uh, so Vanessa Higgins work beads in stone um, contends with this institutional, this legacy of institutional use of Tyndall stone right here at the U of M as Blair had mentioned and is a second project based on the um, uh, work, the original beads and stone she created with uh, Ruth Cahand and a uh, uh, community at the University of Sask uh, Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. <laughs> um, and Vanessa will be speaking about this work in uh, the panel on October 13th, so a couple weeks from now. Um, but it began in this past spring. It's been a, a, a longer project for the exhibition um, with beading, uh, with Vanessa leading beading sessions here on campus and out in the community at Mawa and Art City. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I'm going to leave it at that because I want to keep talking about other people's work. And Vanessa will talk about this next uh, in a couple weeks. Um, so Jeff Thomas's uh, of his work in the exhibition, these this diptych is of um, 
the demolition of a bank building that was at Portage in May, um, and then insignia um, a bank crest that had these culturally appropriative carvings of an indigenous scout figure that was in in the um, uh, yeah in the crest, the logo for the the bank. Um, and I think of, so both Vanessa's and uh, Jeff Thomas's work here are contending with this. We have this built legacy of um, colonial architecture here, and much of it is made in Tyndall stone. Um, and I am interested in these works in both, uh, and this work generally, artist work in in pointing that out and 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 asking, suggest, making suggestions about how we uh, move forward with that. Um, the last bit I will leave you with is, um, this is thinking, this is a bit squirrely, but I think this is kind of a phrase taken from Kara Hamilton on uh, a statement about her work, but thinking about there is this theme through the show of being seen, seeing and being seen. Um, so Kara describes Curtain Wall 3 as uh, questioning the notion of transparency, seeing, being seen, and realizing what's unseen. This is it, looking back through the gallery. And I should, I'm just gonna take a second to say, don't, don't miss the QR code on the bottom or on, on the floor. Um, there's a, a, a virtual reality component to this work that you can, can project through your phone a wall and take that with you out of the gallery. Um, so another work that is dealing with this sense of looking is what the first piece that you see, come, Jeff Thomas's diptych, um, Indian Treaty 1, left and right. So left, the back of his son Bear's head is the first thing you see when you come in the gallery. And on the other side of that is the other, his, uh, the front looking, looking out, as Blair said, towards the queen, the, the portrait of the queen by Christopher Wall. Um, I really think of this, of this image as being this kind of the guide or the, the, the person that brings you into the space. Um, and the, the, just a bit about this series, the Bear portrait be, portraits began in Toronto in 1984 with a chance photograph of the artist's young son uh, on Queen Street in Toronto. And then they continue, he, uh, Thomas continued to this series, um, uh, which grew, uh, as it grew, it captured glimpses of, and the impetus was to capture um, glimpses of contemporary Indigenous life and presence in urban environments, often against backdrops where Indigenous presence was overlooked or not immediately apparent. Um, so this, these photographs are in front of the plaque commemorating Treaty 1 on Lower Fort Gary's walls, which are uh, stone from the Red River, which is made of stone from the Red River Formation. Um, and I think I think that this I, I am I have to I haven't been to Lower Fork area in a while, but I'm pretty sure that the plaque has changed. But this at the time, yeah, I'm, I haven't I have been a while since I read this too. Um, but to me, this the the way that this plaque it has been commemorated and um, um, kind of the the role of Indigenous law in um, uh, in realizing those treaty negotiations and realizing the treaty that we have is not reflected in this um, description. And it, that is something that has has and continues to change. So I think that's what these, uh, when, uh, when you come into the gallery space and see Bear looking at this, this is what I, I see, I want, I hope that people look at it's at looking at how the how um, things like plaques are not they're 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 not static and they're always shifting and they often don't um, tell the whole story. Um, 
And then, of course, uh, The Queen in Winnipeg uh, by Christopher Wall. So this photograph, uh, it's certainly, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I think about it differently, but it, the, it has an added layer of poignancy this after the, uh, since her death. Um, and yeah, I feel grateful to have it uh, as a on display right now uh, in Winnipeg. Um, it was taken, uh, Chris Wall was um, uh, following the Queen's Jubilee tour in the Queen's tour in 2002. And this is really a fleeting moment of the Queen on her way to dinner with her eyes closed in laughter to something said out of frame. Um, yeah, I think as an image of the queen, I am really struck, which is something obviously, especially now we've seen a lot of images of the queen. It is one that I think is pretty unique in being able to, I mean, it's a great photograph. Um, but being able to capture her humanity as a person. And also, I really feel like it uh, brings you to, it, it does both that and, and uh, remind, is a reminder of how much she is not a person and stands for, and uh, has to stand for uh, the legacy that her image represents. And I think that tension is really interesting um, in the image and made more even more significant um, as she's died because that is also like it's such a human thing you can't escape that so I think that that's something I'm thinking of when I uh, with this work even more now um, so the last image here is just of this is the view of the gallery seeing those la those works um, through the space kind of when you come come in um, but that I haven't really completed this thought of, about seeing and being seen, but that is something that is an undercurrent of in, in how I've been placed the work and I'm thinking about it um, because I think that that so much is, it factors in so much to how we think about what we have imparted in on Tyndall Stone as something that both reflects us as a people um, and people who in, in its use. Um, yeah. So I'm going to end by just flipping through some of the upcoming programming. Um, so a couple weeks, everything is on Thursdays. So we've got this talk, as Blair mentioned, with Jane Ma Hutton. This is online. And then the panel with uh, Vanessa Hagen and Trisha Wozni uh, and Robert Poots who's an architectural or a historian and will be talking about his uh, book, uh, Authorized Heritage or drawing from that research, particularly focusing on the history of commemoration at Lower Fort Gary. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, I'd love to see you at the reception this evening, both for, uh, for Moving Matter and for Edward Aquino's Tepome. My the house, am I saying that properly? Tapume, Tapume, which is, yes, when my Portuguese is non-existent, but it's a very, it's a, yeah, awesome show. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Quite a cool experience. Um, and so that, yeah, thank you. Um, does anybody would you stick around and Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Perfect. So why don't we we can kind of maybe pivot back and forth between questions in the room if there are some and questions on Zoom if there are some. Does anybody here have any questions for Abby? I think I'm I'm going to share my screen because it seems like when my sh screen is shared, maybe I'm view viewable on Zoom, but I don't know. Yes, or we can um, pop into the chat here and yes. uh, see what folks on Zoom are saying. Thanks. After after they said after their most mostly most of the early comments oh. are about <laughs> the interpretation. Hello, Vanessa. Nice. Hello, hello. 
Um, well, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk about the um, exhibition design and layout. Oh, the yeah. exhibition is there's, there's lots some of pretty walls. interesting <laughs> angles and it, it's quite architectural in yeah. its construction. And, and I really like it and find it effective. But I, wanna, yeah. about the thinking I mean, that, uh, yeah, that's sort of uh, something I was touching on with this idea yeah. of carrying yeah. carrying sight lines through the show mm -hmm. and uh, through with well, bouncing one work uh, against the other with this idea of looking um, definitely. So that I think that that probably is like the uh, the what what I'm not sure what the words are, but what the the initial thing that informed the rest of the layout was I really wanted you to have this. I think it was very early on the sense of having Jeff Thomas's uh, diptychs of from the bear portraits being this first thing that you see um, and having that draw you into the space and also and having Kara Hamilton's eyes um, at the back, something that you, yeah, that, and kind of more to you. see yeah They're watching you but you can yeah. also look right through them yeah um yeah and I think those the I also didn't want there to be there's you can move through this space however you like but things are sort of grouped in um I'm trying to see if, yeah no um things are grouped in a, a sort of thinking about contending with this uh, our institutional legacy of Tyndall Stone in one area, thinking about how it uh, with, uh, so that's with Evan Collis, Jeff Thomas, and uh, Christopher Wall's work. Um, and then thinking about relating to the rock formation and the rapids, which I think of as the place where we have this connection to the rock formation with Casey Adams, Ariana Munoz Gomez and, and uh, Christina Benera's work. And then moving to the back of the gallery where I think a lot of the artists are thinking about how reflecting on human um, uh, 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 transformation of, and of, of the rock. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it seems like there's a, there's a conceptual movement of um... Or, sorry, there's a physical movement of like molecular structures, ancient time, animals crawling through the Tyndall mm -hmm. stone and being crushed by yeah. geology. <laughs> crushed by geology. Oh, and sweet. I guess so. There's moving, there's moving matter that there's matter that moves itself and matter that people are carrying. So there's also this kind of like carrying the stone or having the stone kind of carry itself. Yeah. I, I'm trying to get my camera to work. Oh. But... <laughs> um yeah well i think uh we've had enough tech ch challenges today it's funny i thought <laughs> it, it worked for a second when i uh you saw it before when i first shared my screen so i thought that might go but good, i should also good. anyway right. just know that abby is here and she's she's here yeah, I'm She's sorry, folks on Zoom. I'm going to pay attention to the chat, though. Yeah, but... take a look in the chats. Does okay. anybody have any follow-up cues? Yeah? Oh, yeah, Liv, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. 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 I think so. Okay, I'm going to try to paraphrase your talk or not, but try to explain, but I don't have the best background in um, the Chicago, the World Fair, World yeah, Expo, but yes. Right. Yeah, so it was, re remind me of the time of it, 18, okay. And yeah, so in Chicago, World Fair, and and yeah, a lot of buildings were built very quickly, stuck white, 
it was material and it was that that fair was very much about cleanliness mm -hmm. right like race uh, racial cleanliness that was the the sense there was this the built city and then there were um like displays of um not european communities well yeah anyway so um but i think that i, I like i know that um t tyndall stone or like limestone has is thought of that that way i think i have less um like focused on the color of the material in that relationship because i feel like it it's it it is inherent to it and that's less less of a thing but a hundred percent the um uh and i haven't i didn't get into that or articulate that very much in this presentation um but thinking about how tyndall stone just became the vehicle through which um uh classical european architecture came here and was used um, so that like, and, and with the world's fair, the Chicago world's fair being that like a pretty significant, um, for the adoption of that architecture within, um, North America, um, yeah, Tyndall stone became that, like, it was just the material that that, that was used here. So it's part of that larger thing, which is both, um, very much about legitimizing um the uh, creation of canada and creating a history here that's connected to europe and obviously uh, uh overwrites um the history that was here um so yeah that's something that is very, is important and in in my research for the book which is more about architecture factors into it yeah i hope that was cool. oh yes yeah, I can read it. Mm. And then you can talk. Oh, sure. Uh, Kathy says a visitor to Winnipeg commented that he felt that the buildings here constructed from Tyndall honored this land. Do you agree? Ooh. Oh. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I don't like, I, uh, I don't have a neutral stance, but I try, and I'm not saying this to be, I don't mean to avoid this question. Um, and I hope when I'm talking about my research it comes across that like I'm I'm anything but neutral I have a I totally have a stance I have a perspective that informs how I share this material with you but I don't I I don't think there's an answer to that some people like in some ways it could be considering honoring this land some way it couldn't be um or it's not and some I think the the way that it became so so tied with institutional architecture and a lot of institutional architecture that have um, uh, exerted power in a harmful way to people um, is uh, is something that it, it's something that you need to that there's a, it's a lot to get over, um, but also like it it's um, yeah there are lots of ways to use the material. Um, where it absolutely it's there's no is um, honors and is from this place um yeah so i think it can be all those all those things and it's that to the different people um depending on its application i i didn't go to uh, the slide i skipped over was um the of the center uh, interior center block which is all tyndall stone so at, at parliament hill so um in ottawa so our the place of our that represents Canada most in architecture built in 1920 and it is there's a, a stone from all over the Tyndall stone features very prominently in the interior there's stone from all over Canada and that use that way that it was used was totally about legitimizing this new country by taking a bit of the material from everywhere so that's one way of doing it then the next was the was Douglas Cardinal um museum of civilization at the museum of history which is just across the river in gatineau and there are these undulating walls of tyndall stone that um cardinal became that really is a signature of his work and transform created a new architectural language that's based in his understanding of or his version of organic architecture that's informed uh that by his uh history as from western canada as a Métis uh, Blackfoot architect um, and that was built in 1989 and that's a totally 
that really changed people's understanding of the material. Um, and that's a different way of looking. And then the third uh, in that thing was looking at Tom Fougere's uh, Tyndall table, which is a low slung that was um, coffee table. That's 2013, I think it was. Um, and I have talked, to, I talk about that table as being this like very minimalist, um, just as, cause it's, it's like, it's so simple that it's almost like, it's not even being changed. It's like just the material. Um, it is, it's, it's totally, and it's, it's very close to, it's very refined, but close to what a block of stone that's removed from the quarry would be. And I think that for that table or what that, that work hinges on its connection to this to uh, uh, it's very much about a prairie identity and a, a sort of um, uh, a kind of contemporary take on prairie identity. So those are, which I'm not really explaining too much there, but ideas about how different people can connect with uh, to the material very differently. So I think there's, uh, yeah, what was this? Did I lose the question? Is there, does, does the use of construction Tindlestone honor the land? It can. And it, yeah, it really depends, but yeah. Ah, oh, thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I'm, um, oh, yes. Sorry, I'm to the photographs studied for Indian Schultz's project. And he is, he is going to himself, a figure of good meaning for artistic development um not particular i don't think so like in it's in the like for that type of sculpture like a uh, sculpture uh i mean it's definitely used but um it's trickier than um a uh, even bodied material so that those models um that i talked about at the very beginning are it's similar to dolomitic limestone so it's two slightly different compositions of the material and there one is much harder the dolomite which is the darker models versus the light limestone yeah dolomite's much harder um so it it's uneven so it's unpredictable i think that's what i've been told by people who carve with the material so it's often in many buildings like i think the ledge parliament hill for really detailed that kind of tradition detailed carving it's um there's often another like Indiana limestone that's subbed in. Um, yeah, this is a, a extent um, sidebar to that question, but but you can and there's so much Tyndall stone just outside, so you can check this out right now. But to be able to see that the difference of the material, if you there's a, it causes a thing called differential weathering, where the limestone will wear away faster than the dolomite, which is harder. Um, so if you look at any steps or anything that's been up for a while, if there's the darker models are kind of raised because the limestone is um, is wearing away faster. Yeah. That's all. Thank Just you. some facts. <laughs> I kind of love the phrase differential weather. I know, isn't that and a good one? If you did another yeah. exhibition <laughs> about, be... about stone. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it could be about different stone coming together. Yeah. Ooh, sweet. Um, well. Oh, I question. just typed perfect. out the question for the viewers yes, on um, Zoom that might uh, might not have heard it from the from the audience. Um, well, if there are no other questions, then I would just once again want to thank you, Abby, for coming. Thank all of you for coming, and encourage everyone to come to the opening tonight at five between five and eight. And um, if you have any more questions, Abby will be there, uh, as will many of the artists. And um, yeah. I'm sure you'd, you'd be happy to uh, uh, talk more about yeah, Rock and course. Stone. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Zoom. Zoom friends. Take care. Right. See you tonight. Okay.